We call him Ramses the Great, the only pharaoh that has actually given that title, but they called him Ramses the Great God. The true wealth of Egypt was not the gold that they derived from the, the mines. It was the golden grains of wheat and barley that they used to bake the bread that fed the men, that mined the gold or that quarried the stone and dragged the blocks to build the monuments. But one of them, he claims he was made a commander of the army at the age of 10 that they used to drag these blocks up on these wooden sledges with teams of men. We know they then set them into place and that as the pyramid rose, they extended these ramps and, and moved them up. The only other wives of Ramses but that we can name are the five wives that were actually his daughters. Ramses II is often regarded as the greatest, most celebrated and most powerful pharaoh of the New Kingdom which itself was the most powerful period of ancient Egypt. In his seven decades reign, he erected more monuments and statues and fathered more children than any other pharaoh. I've been curious to learn about Ramses for some time, and luckily, I found a very comprehensive book on the pharaoh by the Egyptologist Dr. Peter Brandt of the University of Memphis, who then kindly agreed to join me on the podcast. We discussed pre-Ramses ancient Egypt, the birth of the 19th dynasty, the Ramses' ascent to power, his achievements and legacy, and many other things. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe. And now we start. Did you choose to teach in the University of Memphis because it was also a capital of Lower Egypt? Well, I mean, I was very fortunate that they chose me. But certainly, um, the modern city of Memphis does have this connection with ancient Memphis. I mean, it sits here on the Mississippi River, which is, of course, the American Nile, as it were. Uh -huh. uh, and there's another city, of course, north of Memphis uh, in southern Illinois called Cairo is how they pronounce it, but it's spelled like Cairo. And uh, the city of Memphis does take its uh, connection with ancient Memphis uh, rather seriously. We have here in the University of Memphis, the Egyptian Institute. We also have a, a pyramid. And recently, um, they installed here at the University of Memphis a replica of one of the statues of Ramses II at the entrance of the university. So we were quite pleased with that. And we have a program in Egyptology here. And so I was very fortunate that they chose me to be one of the Egyptologists uh, here. And I, I lead a project in Egypt, ironically, not at the ancient city of Memphis, but at another major city of ancient Egypt, the city of Thebes, working uh, at the Temple of Karnak, where um, I record inscriptions in one of the huge parts of the temple called the Hypostyle Hall, this forest of columns uh, that is completely covered with hieroglyphic texts and beautiful wall carvings that was built by Ramses' father, Seti I, and, and completed with uh, more inscriptions by Ramses II himself. And this Thebes is the same Thebes we see in ancient Greek, right? Well, the name is inspired by uh, by the this, the name. Uh, when the Greeks came to Egypt, they found, of course, that the Egyptians, you know, had all these names for their cities, and they uh, identified these various native Egyptian cities with some names. But, uh, of course, the Egyptians didn't call Thebes Thebes. They had their own. Uh, they called Thebes Wasa, or Waset is how we often transcribe it. They also called it the city, uh, which uh, which is uh, something like Tani. When they, when they called it the city, Tani, it's sort of like when they call New York the Big Apple. It was, it was kind of a nickname. I suspect it was that sort of uh, you know, nickname for, uh, for Thebes that inspired the Greeks to uh, equate Thebes with Greek city of Thebes. Why do you think people are so fascinated with ancient Egypt? I think it's a combination of sort of the exoticness, but also some, to some sense, the, you know, the familiarity. I mean, obviously the Egyptians were, you know, people that are accessible to us, you know, the, the, their humanity, but also just how exotic and uh, grandiose their culture is. I mean, giant pyramids, uh, the hieroglyphic writing system, which is so exotic and tantalizing with uh, all these uh, 
amazing little figures and you just want to know what it means. I mean, you can look at other scripts, and especially something like Babylonian cuneiform. It certainly looks you know, exotic, uh, baffling, but it's not as inviting as all those little animals and human figures and uh, strange objects that you know what it is. You see the little crocodiles and birds and human figures doing all kinds of things, and you can recognize what they are, but you have no idea what the text means, and you want to know what, what they're saying. And of course, the mummified uh, bodies, and you're wondering, who were these people? And you see these giant pyramids and exotic monuments. And of course, you can see the humanity of the Egyptians when you look at the wall inscriptions and the beautiful paintings in the Egyptian tombs and you see people going about their daily lives or enjoying banquets or just even burying their dead. Again, it's all very familiar, but then again, you also see uh, the scenes of Egyptian religion with these uh, animal-headed deities. It's extremely exotic and also very alien in some ways. And so I think all those reasons just makes Egypt very mysterious, but for, uh, familiar, very intimate, but very exotic. And for all those reasons, I think it's just captivating to people. We're going to be talking about uh, 19th dynasty and primarily uh, Ramses II. But before we start, like, let's try to fit previous 2000 years into like in a summary of what happened in Egypt starting from first dynasty to end of the 18. Yes, yeah, so when Ramses comes to the throne, um, Egyptian civilization already went back more than 2,000 years. In fact, if you consider prehistory, it was well over 3,000 years. By about 3,300 years before the birth of Christ, you find that it, prehistoric civilization was coalescing into one of the first ancient nation states. Uh, when the earliest kings of the first dynasty uh, had uh, coalesced uh, the, the lower Nile Valley from about the ancient city of, of um, Elephantini at modern Aswan to the, uh, the Nile Delta uh, at the coast of the Mediterranean Sea into this territorial state, a unified kingdom, which they conceived of as the unification of these two kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt, which was part of Egypt's national mythology. And uh, these early kings built this, this kingdom, uh, ruled over it. And as we move into uh, the Old Kingdom period, they increased their power. They developed all these new technologies, uh, some of the most important being uh, administration, which they could do because they had developed a writing system, the famous hieroglyphic writing system. Um, and of course, they had papyrus to write on, and they had a, a, a cursive script called hieratic, so they could keep track of daily business. And they experimented with monumental architecture, ultimately resulting in the construction of huge pyramids, which uh, reached their zenith, of course, in the fourth dynasty, when they built the giant pyramid at, at ancient Giza. Uh, Do we know the, how those pyramids were built because that's kind of ongoing debate somebody saying like hey that's aliens somebody say that hey this is actually was pretty simple for them back in the day so stop this nonsense what's your take the ongoing debate goes on among people that just don't want to accept um what you know uh, experts and scientists and egyptologists have actually long determined that, uh, you know, conspiracy theories and weird YouTube channels aside, we know exactly how they did it. You know, we may argue over some of the finer details, uh, but, uh, but these are only minor questions of, uh, of how they arranged the ramps uh, and on which the, the blocks were dragged up uh, to put them in place. But we know what kind of tools they used. We know the basic method they used to shift the blocks. We know they uh, so they used uh, basic copper chisels to cut uh, the rather soft limestone. We know they uh, mounted uh, the individual blocks on these sort of wooden sledges, almost like you know these. Except they, it wasn't snow; it was on sand and dirt that they used to drag these blocks up on these wooden sledges with teams of men. We know, uh, th you know, they then set them into place, and that as the pyramid rose, uh, 
they extended these ramps and and moved them up. Uh, there's debate about whether these ramps were just long straight ramps or whether they started to wrap around the sides of the pyramids, whether there would have been one or two or four ramps that accessed uh, a pyramid on, on each of the sides or whatever. But the basic methods that they use are well known. And we actually have remains, for instance, of some of these ramps, or even on one pyramid, we even see the uh, the impression left by one of these ramps after it had been removed, and ramps that are preserved on, on other monuments. Uh, so we know the basic methods that they use to build these things. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, in popular culture, especially in the sort of the conspiratorial community of people that just don't want to accept this or think that people like me, you know, are trying to keep the, the truth a secret or just, you know, somehow closed minded. That is not a good enough answer. And, uh, you know, they want to believe in conspiracy theories or that there's a cover up. I once had a guy that was sending me pictures of giant statues that he believed that were being found all over the world of an alien civilization or early civilization that was building giant, you know, statues of animals all over the world. And, uh, kept on sending these to me and and pointing them out and he would ask me you know about this and then I basically told him well, the phenomena where you sort of see pictures in the clouds or familiar shapes and strange objects and he said you know after I explained this to him he said well how much do they pay you to say that and I said they don't pay me nearly enough to say that dude <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another example of this with there's an inscription actually the pharaoh Seti the first and Ramses the second at the temple of Abydos where there's two sets of hieroglyphs talk, mm -hmm. uh, carved over top of each other. And because of this, and this is a, a fairly common phenomenon, which we call a palimpsest, where one inscription is carved over another. It was originally the old inscription was covered with plaster, so you wouldn't have seen the old inscription, but 3,000 years later, the plaster has fallen away, and the two stone inscriptions are now overlapping. And because of the way they're overlapping, the jumble of hieroglyphs, one of them kind of looks like the shape of a helicopter. <laughs> so some people think that this is evidence that they had <laughs> helicopters. It's just a, a suggestive shape. Nobody thought it looked like a helicopter until such time that there are helicopters in the modern world. In the 19th century, nobody saw a helicopter because there were no helicopters. But now because we have helicopters, and in particular, they look like a modern American helicopter. <laughs> in the 1950s, before we had this particular type of helicopter, nobody also thought it looked like a helicopter because back in the 1950s, those helicopters did not yet exist. So again, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. Our fourth dynasty and Giza and what was happening from there onwards? There are these up and down phases in Egyptian history. So a couple of hundred years after the, the height of pyramid building, you have this decline where you have this period of decentralization um, and the, the central authority breaks down and there's even a period of sort of uh, civil war. And then you have a new period of centralization, strong uh, control under the Middle Kingdom period. The Middle Kingdom pharaohs, especially during the, the 12th dynasty, also continue to build pyramids, but they're of a much smaller scale. Um, the Middle Kingdom is one of the great periods of Egyptian literature. They also expand much more than previously into uh, Nubia in the south, building a, a, a very elaborate series of fortif fortified outposts in the northern part of Nubia, and also in increasingly confronting another rival civilization in the southern part of Nub Nubia called the Kingdom of Kush. And they also uh, continue uh, intensive contacts with what we call the Levant, uh, you know, the, the coastal region of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Canaan, uh, Lebanon, and coastal Syria. And again, uh, after a couple of centuries, there's once again a, um, a breakdown of the central authority. And uh, it's during this uh, second period, which we call intermediate periods, it's a rather unsatisfactory term, but during the second intermediate period in Nubia, the kingdom of Kush uh, sort of moves north, even threatening southern Egypt 
homeland proper uh, it absorbs these uh military outposts in in Nubia that had originally been uh, constructed to sort of keep the Nubians out and uh in northernmost Egypt in the delta um a group of uh, peoples from the Levant, which the Egyptians called the Hyksos, the rulers of foreign countries, gained sway over uh, the northernmost part of Egypt, and the Egyptians find themselves hemmed in by foreigners. And there's, uh, at the ancient city of Thebes, eventually a and a dynasty which we call the 17th dynasty eventually sort of launches what is often called a kind of war of national liber liberation, although whether it's similar to a kind of modern war of liberation might be a bit of a stretch. But they eventually uh, expel the Hyksos from the north, and this uh, transitions into the glorious 18th dynasty, which after not only um, expelling the Hyksos, then goes on to become this sort of great imperial dynasty that not only uh, reconquers Nubia and expands into the Levant and creates this great imperial dynasty, puts Egypt on the map as a kind of ancient superpower, extends Egypt's empire farther than it ever had been. You see Egypt then engaging uh, with other rival empires during the period that we know as uh, the Late Bronze Age, uh, which is a period of rival empires uh, in the ancient Near East, competing militarily, but also interacting uh, diplomatically. It's a, a period of intensive trade and diplomacy, the exchange of technology. And it, it's, sort of, it's sort of one of the high points uh, and uh, the most sophisticated period of exchanges during the whole of the ancient world uh, in ancient history. And of course, after, again, a couple of centuries, at the end of the 18th dynasty, things break down. Um, you have, perhaps at the apogee of the 18th dynasty, the pharaoh Amenhotep III, the kind of ancient Egyptian sun king, when uh, his predecessors had been in competition with one of the other great emp uh, empires, Mitanni, over control of Syria. Eventually, Amenhotep III's father had uh, achieved peace with Mitanni after decades of rivalry. There's more or less peace in the Levant, and so Amenhotep III is able to have uh, peace on his frontiers. Um, he is a great builder king, builds numerous temples all across Egypt. Uh, he raises himself as a kind of god king, uh, celebrates uh these jubilee festivals in the last decade of his reign, and he deifies himself as a living God on earth. During his reign, we also see increasingly not quite monotheism, but we see an uh, an emphasis on uh, the pantheon of Egypt's many gods uh, being seen as a reflection of a single universal sun god, where all of the gods are just seen as extensions of, of a supreme solar god. And this uh, solar god is also increasingly seen as one with the king himself. And so we're not quite at true monotheism, but we're sort of at a halfway point between polytheism and monotheism. And increasingly, the king himself is seen as a manifestation of this. And this paves the way for his son, the famous King Akhenaten, to take the next logical step and to eventually do away with all the other gods and in favor of just the one sun god. And even then, whether or not Akhenaten was truly a monotheist is still up for debate, in, at least among Egyptologists. But there's no question that he does away with all the traditional gods, and especially the supreme imperial god Amun-Re. Uh, in favor of this uh, unique solar god that is manifest as uh, the sun disk, um, known as the Aten. Uh, although I would argue that the Aten is a manifestation of the traditional sun god, Ray. But the focus is, uh, Ray is no longer considered to be in the traditional, you know, human form as a man with a, a falcon's head. There's no more traditional imagery of uh, what we call anthropomorphic in human form or animal form of, of these gods or any other gods. It's just as the sun disk in, in the sky, 
is this otherwise rather more abstract image of the god all the traditional imagery and rituals are all gone and it's just Akhenaten and Nefertiti and their children offering food and drink to uh the sun god whose rays come down and have little hands that extend symbols of life and crest the king and the queen and and touch the altars that have the food offerings for them and all the other iconography and and symbolism is completely gone uh in this rather ra radically puritanical new uh religious revolution that he's launched i don't know how people reacted to that it's hard to say um because uh we only have Akhenaten's version of events <laughs> at least during his reign as as far as we know people basically took their marching orders and kept their mouth shut there are hints that that there was grumbling even from the king himself there was one of his inscriptions where he is establishing his new city at the site of Akhenaten uh this new capital that he built uh, the inscription is damaged but at one point he talks about establishing this city and we get this uh report about how there is apparently some kind of grumbling and he said uh the the response from the courtiers was it was worse than i'd heard about uh you know in what in this year and it was worse than i heard in that year and it was worse than i heard in the year before and it was worse than i that was heard in the year of my father and it was worse than it was heard in the years of my grandfather and you know what it was that was so bad we have no idea but he he obviously refers to some people grumbling about something and it's rather unprecedented you know where the king would report that people were you know uh complaining about something but we don't know what it was that they were complaining about or what the king exactly is talking about now the fact that very soon after the king's death that everything that he uh, did was very quickly re repudiated and that all of his uh reforms were dismantled in fact his memory itself sanctioned to the point if you will he was destalinized he was, you know there was a complete program of deoknotization if you will his monuments were dismantled uh his memory was officially sanctioned so that his name was removed his statues were smashed in fact his great capital of Akhenaten in middle egypt was essentially raised to the ground and abandoned and uh, as we can see in the time of the early ramesside kings so for instance in the temple that seti the uh, 1st and also ramses the 2nd built at the the city of abydos in both cases they they created these king lists uh, to honor the memory of all the kings of egypt that came before them all the kings from the time of what we call the amarna period from akhenaten down to uh king i those kings are all omitted from the list of worthy ancestors and they are omitted because they were associated with Akhenaten and his policies and they were considered illegitimate and unworthy they were essentially politically incorrect wasn't Tutankhamun son of Akhenaten most likely there have been uh, arguments amongst some scholars that it proposed he could have been also the son of Amenhotep the 3rd or even this shadowy uh, king Smenkare who was another one of these uh, kings that that briefly reigned after Akhenaten however the most likely father of Tutankhamun would have been Akhenaten i believe Tutankhamun was the one who started dismantling all the legacy of his father or not necessarily Uh, by and large but even in the immediate aftermath of Akhenaten there seems to have been a rapprochement there probably were two uh, very briefly reigned uh, kings uh, one of whom was actually a female pharaoh named Neferneferuaten who reigned very briefly between Akhenaten and Tutankhamun uh, and at least there were beginnings of of rapprochement towards the traditional pantheon but i mean we're talking about only a few years maybe four at most and uh they also to some extent probably tried to continue the policies of Akhenaten at the same time that they began to reestablish the traditional cults but once uh, Tutankhamun came to the throne and of course he was a child and so he wasn't necessarily making these decisions but these decisions at least initially were made in his name then the official reestablishment of the traditional religion 
And most importantly, of course, that of the cult of the god Amun. And we have this great restoration inscription that was set up at Karnak that especially focuses on the reestablishment of the cult of the god Amun, which, of course, was the one that suffered the worst from Akhenaten's policies, that describes in detail the uh, efforts that uh, Tutankhamun took to restore uh, the cult of the god of moon, everything from restoring the 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 gold the gilded cult icons of the god to establishing uh, you know all the rich endowments of uh, property and uh, offerings and uh, even reestablishing the personnel for the cult of the god that had been stripped from it. It was a bit like what happened when Henry VIII disestablished uh, the Catholic Church, uh, you know, where he stripped the monasteries and the churches of all their properties, as well as, as outlawing the, uh, the Catholic faith. Uh, and so that th this all had to be reestablished. And so uh, that's what Tutankhamun set about to do. He also, of course, had to repair the damage that the iconoclasts had. They had destroyed all the statues, and even though they didn't dismantle the temples like Karnak Temple, they had gone in and with the chisels, they had uh, chiseled away all the images and all the inscriptions that named or pictured the gods on the temple walls. And during uh, Tutankhamun's reign, they had to go and physically repair all these images and all these um, uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions on the walls of the temples. They also had to produce a lot of new statues that uh, that represented the god Amun. And um, one of the things I studied in my dissertation on Seti the First is how when uh, Tutankhamun had re repaired many of these images on the temple walls, that at a later date, uh, this uh, early Ramazide pharaoh Seti the First had come back and re-restored many of them, and then left inscriptions where he took credit for doing this. How did we go from 18th dynasty to 19th? There wasn't like blood lineage there, right? Yes. Tutankhamun, it, it, as it turns out, was the last natural heir of the uh, of the 18th dynasty. And uh, as we know from his mummy in scientific study, he had a lot of uh, of ailments. And uh, one of the things that happened in the 18th dynasty was probably quite common in many of these royal families was a degree of interbreeding because um, pharaohs would marry their close female relatives with brother sister or half brother sister um, marriages and even though these kings were polygamous and would have married um, many wives and probably the vast majority of them would not be related by blood the marriages that were to the most senior wives were often the closest uh, related ones that when they married the the half sisters those were the ones that were their senior wives and those would produce the children that would be favored as heirs. And so there would have been in inbreeding. And of course, it would be the most inbred children would be favored as the heirs. And so Tutankhamun was the genetic end of the line after decades or even centuries of inbreeding. And uh, the only evidence we have of any children that he and his sister wife Anka Sanaman, one of the daughters of Akhenaten, had is that in his tomb, they found uh, the mummified remains of two late-term uh, fetuses of, of two little girls uh, that had massive uh, birth defects. And so he died without issue, and it was necessary then to appoint uh, an heir. The two uh, men who then succeeded Tutankhamun in turn a senior courtier named I, who may have been related as a as an in-law, uh, a man named I, died apparently without an heir to succeed him. And then uh, another man who is a senior general, and then also seems to have been groomed uh, for office because he was also given uh, high uh, civilian titles and marked out as an heir presumptive, a general named Horemheb, who also became vizier, and which is a kind of prime minister, and received other high titles, then came to the throne. And uh, he also seems to have had problems uh, 
fathering an heir. He uh, left a tomb when he was still a non-royal in the cemetery of ancient Memphis at the modern site of Saqqara. And when it was excavated, they found the skeleton of a woman that they believe was his wife, Mutnojimit, that was actually, she was buried there when she had become queen. And uh, they found among her skeleton and the abdomen, they found the bones of a fetus. And um, when they examined her uh, pelvis, they found that there was scar tissue that suggested that she had suffered a number of uh, unsuccessful pregnancies. And of course, the final one had killed her and her unborn baby. And so it paints a picture of this rather sad domestic tragedy where she was desperately trying to give Horam Heb an heir, and, and it ultimately cost her and her unborn child their lives. So he also failed to produce an heir. Now, again, Horam Heb, presumably as a pharaoh, had many wives, but it seems that he had to produce an heir only by his senior wife. And therefore, failing that, he had to turn once again for the third time in a row to an appointee to the throne. So he had to choose carefully because by this point, the traditional idea that the throne of Egypt had to be passed from father to son was beginning to break down. And the mythology of kingship, uh, that every king was an, uh, was Horus, and that when he died, he became Osiris, the god of underworld, who then passed the throne to his son, who was the god Horus, the god of kingship. That was beginning to to seem redundant or or uh, you know passe, and so uh, it was necessary to make sure that the next king really did have an heir, and so he appointed another general named Paramesu. And Paramesu, who would become Ramses the first, had a son, also a vigorous, uh, uh, you know, healthy uh, young man named Seti, who had just produced another uh, little boy, whose name was Paramesu, named after his grandfather, who would, was better known to us as the future Ramses the second. So ready-made dynasty, ready to go. You wrote books on Seti and Ramsey II, among others, right? What is your fascination with these two characters? It goes back, I think, to childhood. I was also very interested in Tut and Common. Um, growing up in the 1970s, the Tut mania, there was the big exhibition that was going around North America and the world at that point. But my family used to collect the National Geographic um, magazines, and there were all these issues about saving the temples of Abu Simbel. And I used to pore over them in, in this remarkable temple and how they had cut it into pieces and saved it from Lake Nasser when the, they built the Aswan Dam in the 1960s. And there was also this National Geographic TV uh, special. This was in the days before they had all these uh uh, you know, uh, cable channels where they show documentaries all the time, uh, you know, like Discovery and the History Channel. There was like one of these uh, shows a year, and they had one called Egypt Quest for Eternity that came on. And and the main theme that ran through the show was about Ramses, and they talked about Abu Simbel. They talked about the Temple of Seti at Abydos, and, uh, and they, they talked about the Egyptian Hittite Peace Treaty and the Tomb of Seti I. And the the University of Chicago's mission to record all the inscriptions, and pretty much a lot of the highlights of my career, and even uh, the professor that I ended up studying with uh, at the University of Memphis, were were all in this do uh, documentary. It was almost like mm -hmm. it was almost like prophetic for my entire career, and so I think this is why actually I ended up studying Seti and Ramses. What was the interesting thing about Seti? Who did you find the most curious well, and fascinating, maybe? Well, I was initially drawn to him by just the, how beautiful the art was. The Temple of Seti, this is the temple that he built at the site of Abydos. In, um, uh, it's north of ancient Thebes, uh, and uh, it's built of limestone, and the quality of the wall carvings is just exquisite. They're among, if if not the, among the most beautiful, extremely elegant, just of the highest quality. Many of them still have their paint as well, which is rather rare for uh, the temples because the walls are often preserved, but the roofs of Egyptian temples are often uh, gone, and therefore the paint that covered the walls of the temples is usually missing. But they're just absolutely exquisitely beautiful. And so that captivated me. The other thing is that Seti also built this marvelous building at Karnak Temple, the Great Hypostyle Hall, 
where I, of course, now work, which is a giant forest of columns, it's just massive building. You could fit Notre Dame Cathedral inside of this building with this uh, forest of 134 gigantic uh, stone uh, columns. Some of them are 70 feet tall. That captivated me, I think, and uh, I became intrigued by Seti I. And, of course, his connection with my other favorite pharaoh, uh, Ramses II. So it was sort of, it was a family affair. Do you think they had these grandiose temples as a result of them kind of knowing that they did not come from actual royal blood, but kind of inherited it some non-direct way, and they tried to almost compensate for it? I think that that's part of the explanation. I mean, one of the things, as a new royal family, they would have felt the need to demonstrate their uh, um, their authority or their legitimacy. Now, uh, building monuments and demonstrating their loyalty or their uh, bona fides to the gods uh, and also uh, doing what it, what is expected of uh, of a pharaoh, which is to be a great builder, to be a great warrior, to devote themselves to the service of the gods. These are all expectations of any pharaoh. But for a new royal line, all the more is expected of them because they don't have the virtue of having been pharaoh or of having come from a long line of previous kings. So there was all the more expectations that they make a mark for themselves. And so from that perspective, yes, I think they had something to prove. Those monuments are not cheap to make, right? What was the source of wealth of Egypt of that time? The source of Egypt's wealth actually was uh, was its agricultural prosperity. You know, I, I, one of the things I'm also looking into, and I, I give a lecture about the gold of the pharaohs, and I remember talking about how they, um, they even plated monuments like obelisks with gold. And somebody asked me, well, how much gold did it cost to buy an obelisk? And I said, well, that's not how it worked. The true wealth of Egypt was not the gold that they derived from the, the mines. It was the golden grains of wheat and barley and uh, that they used to, uh, to bake the bread that fed the men, that mined the gold or that, uh, that quarried the stone and dragged the blocks to build the monuments. And um, Egypt was super abundant in agricultural produce. And Grain was money. The fields of Egypt that that uh, produce all this food, but especially the basic staples of the ancient Egyptian diet, which was bread and beer. These essentials of the diet produced the calories that allowed uh, the construction of all these monuments and that fed the armies that you know expanded the Egyptian empire that made all of this uh, possible. And we know during the New Kingdom uh, period, for instance, after they eventually made peace with the, the Hittite Empire, there was even at one point when the Hittite Empire uh, was in decline and was suffering from widespread famine and food shortages, we hear of uh, shipments of grain from Egypt to feed the the Hittite Empire in what may be the earliest evidence for international food aid. And when you think about the, the case of, um, of people migrating into the Nile Delta, including the biblical story of Joseph, uh, the idea that Egypt was the breadbasket of the ancient world that attracted economic refugees. And of course, if you fast forward to the time of the Roman Empire, where if it wasn't for Egypt sh uh, shipping huge amounts of grain, uh, the great metropolis of Rome with one to two million people would have starved. This is what allowed the uh, pharaohs to build these huge monuments, as well as to marshal the armies that, that conquered Nubia and Syria and Canaan. That was the true wealth of Egypt. How powerful was Egyptian's army? And what do we know about it? Well, the Egyptian army was organized apparently into a series of divisions. At, at the Battle of Kadesh, for instance, uh, it seemed to have had four divisions named after four of the principal gods of the Egyptian pantheon. So we had the army of Amun, of the god Re, of the god Ptah, and of the god Seth. We can only guess at the average number of soldiers. There's one text, it's actually a quarry expedition, which a division of the army was sent out to procure stone for the royal sarcophagus. 
that suggests that may have consisted of about 5,000 soldiers. The bulk of them would have been infantrymen, perhaps levied from you know villages and towns, especially in the northern part of Egypt. Uh, the elite members of the army would have been uh, the chariotry. One suspects that many of them would have actually come from more of the elite branches of society. And we even have um, some uh, writing, especially model letters or model writings that were used to train scribes that suggest that there's one that tells about a guy who basically wants to be a hot rod chariot jockey and talks about who he has to scrape together uh, funds to be able to buy his own chariot and get some money from his relatives, and then immediately goes out on his first jaunt riding in his chariot and immediately crashes into a thorn bush and gets, you know, stung by nettles and bugs. But it, it suggests that, you know, it wasn't just peasants riding around in chariots, that you had to be elite, you know, from the, uh, the better uh, strata of Egyptian society to become a member of this elite branch of uh, the Egyptian army. So, uh, yeah, there's a hierarchy of the, the upper officers, but of course, they're only a small part of the uh, the overall forces. Let's talk about Ramses II. What do we know about his childhood? There's a certain amount we can uh, sort of guess at from what you would have expected of both as a member of the elite and as a royal child. We suspect that he would have been educated in an institution that was known as the COP, which is often called the Royal Nursery. And it seems to have been uh, part of the overall royal household, uh, where royal children, uh, especially royal sons, were housed and educated along with uh, children of other elite families, essentially uh, children of uh, the courtiers but also perhaps children of uh, foreign elites, in particular the, uh, the children of foreign vassal kings who were obliged, uh, these vassal kings were obliged to send uh, their children, especially their sons, as hostages uh, to the pharaoh's court where they were then Egyptianized and socialized, and they were kept on the good behavior of their of their fathers. And then after years, uh, when they were old enough to succeed their fathers, they were then sent back. And of course, they would have been you know, strangers in their own lands, would have been presumably more loyal or sympathetic to Egypt. Now, the, the courtiers, of course, would then be socialized and uh, you know uh, loyal to the the royal son who then became pharaoh. And the the future pharaoh would have been socialized with the the boys who would eventually become his uh, officials. So that was part of the social uh, role of this institution called the COP. It also would have uh, served as a school to uh, to train uh, these boys to uh, read and write. And so there they would have been trained as scribes. The scribal school was was a bit tough. It was a sort of like uh, educational boot camp. And one wonders whether they would have spared the rod even for a future pharaoh. There was an old saying uh, among the scribal teachers uh, is that uh, the ears of a scribe are on his back. In other words, that he learns when you beat him. They were trained by copying out great works of Egyptian literature, and eventually they would learn them by taking dictation. And so they would have been trained by learning to copy out uh, these uh, works of Egyptian literature. And in fact, it was many of the great literary pieces from the time of the Middle Kingdom were the kind of things that they would have uh, learned to copy and write down, first perhaps by copying them out and eventually by learning to take dictation as the um, the master scribe would recite them. Uh, in fact, sometimes the copies we have of many of these great works of literature were actually schoolboy copies that some scribe kept out of a sense of nostalgia mm -hmm. from his schoolboy days that he then deposited it in his tomb. And when he was born, his grandfather, Rams Ramses I, wasn't a pharaoh yet, right? No, he. I mean, he presumably was born as a private citizen in the, in the later part of uh, Horemheb's reign. 
of course. And he, even then, he may have, you know, at some point, if, if depending on how how old he was when his grandfather actually became pharaoh, it's even possible he may have entered the cop. Presumably by the time he was born, both uh, Paramesu and Seti, the future Seti I, had already reached very high levels in uh, the military and uh, sort of, you will, the civilian side of the, the, the Egyptian government under Horemheb. Because already Horemheb was planning that these men uh, might very well succeed him, and they both held very high offices, just as Horemheb had held very high offices during the reigns of Tutankhamun and I. And so already great things were expected of them, and mm. presumably little the little future Ramses II himself. So he might have already uh, entered the cop, even if it was just as a member of the elite, not necessarily yet as a princeling. Yeah, education wouldn't change, so that makes sense. So, and when does he become uh, the so-called prince? Once uh, his uh, grandfather becomes king, whether he then becomes officially a prince by gaining the, what's the title of what's called Sa Nesu, king's son, it's not entirely clear. But the, if if his status at that point is ambiguous, and we don't have any inscription ever that 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 gives a title that's called the equivalent of grandson of a king, but if that status was ambiguous, the ambiguity only lasts for about you know less than two years because. Uh, Ramses the first uh, scarcely rules for more than about a year and a half, but certainly um, once his father Seti the first then take takes the throne, then there's no question that Ramses the second, the future Ramses the second, not only becomes a king's son, uh, but he also is the king's eldest son and heir apparent. And from that point on, then he is definitely the senior king's son, and he is designated as the future pharaoh. And therefore, and whether or not we have no idea uh, whether he had any uh, other brothers, um, he certainly didn't have any older brothers, although at one point, some Egyptologists believe that he did. There is no evidence for that, although you will read in older books uh, ideas about that he that he had an older brother and that he may have even pushed an older brother aside. There really is no evidence in support of that. And, and, and I don't think anybody really does or certainly should not believe that. But Ramses was the eldest son and the one that was marked out to be Seti's heir. And therefore, all attention was paid to ensuring that he was prepared to one day succeed his father as Pharaoh. And therefore, his his training said he took very great, great care to make sure that he is prepared. And therefore, he has to receive training to become a future warrior king. He needs to learn how to serve the gods in the temples. He needs to learn how to be an administrator to oversee things like building projects, how to interact with the courtiers, all these kind of things. And through royal monuments and royal decrees, and even the way that once he does become king, the way uh, Ramses reminisces in some important inscriptions about the days when he was a prince under Seti, we can learn something about Ramses' on-the-job training from his days as crown prince under the reign of his father Seti. I think you mentioned in the book that he was assigned at a small army or even became the general type of thing in the age of early 10s or something like that. Yeah, so um, he, two important inscriptions that he leaves uh, from the early years of his own reign after Sedis died, he talks about his career. And s some of these, he's obviously exaggerating or boasting, <laughs> but one of them he claims he was made a commander of the army at the age of 10. This could be interpreted one of two ways. It either could be that he's basically you know, boasting, and this is just sort of exaggeration, or it could be taken at face value. Perhaps uh, years ago, you might have thought that this was just a boast or he's just a... But I mean, we also know, for instance, looking at uh, some of the inscriptions that refer to Ramsey's own sons that are created during his reign, where we find uh, a number of his sons uh, that are also given titles like Great General of the Army, uh, and that these inscriptions are made, obviously, when these sons are quite young, whether they were 10 years old or 12 years old or 15 or 20. Uh, 
he does give his sons these titles at rather young ages, uh, even if we can't say exactly how old they were, but they certainly were not in their 30s when they received these titles. So it, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. On the other hand, just because they received these titles doesn't necessarily mean that they are essentially really running the show when they actually hold these titles. They could still be quite symbolic, mm -hmm. uh, even if they actually do hold this title. I think it's more a case of that he does hold these titles, but it might be more for show than for uh, than a case of him making it up that he that he did not get the title. It looked to me that Sadie was really concerned about continuation of the uh, dynasty, right? And that's why he basically created this house of uh, women for Ramses. Can you speak about that a little? Yeah, this is one of the more uh, fascinating aspects. There was another inscription Ramses left at this temple of his father, the, the city of Abydos. And he leaves this long inscription where he reminisces in his first year as Pharaoh about how Seti had carefully prepared him to one day succeed him. And he, he says that Seti had established what he calls a female household, sort of in the idea of a household of, of women for him that was comparable to the to the the beautiful maidens of the palace and it goes on to say that uh, and the inscription is partly damaged so there are gaps but he says that he selected wives for me you know the said he has selected wives for ramses from throughout probably throughout egypt or throughout the land that part is missing. And then there's a reference, again, the inscription's a bit damaged, but there's a reference to beautiful female companions, and then something about probably children being nursed. And it's pretty clear that multiple women are selected from across a wide range of either uh, you know uh, territory or from a, a large group of people, et cetera. And that the result is multiple babies being born uh, that are then, you know, nursed or, uh, you know, uh, raised, you know, uh, reared. And uh, although despite this damage, it's it's pretty clear that, you know, at a relatively young age, you know, shortly after puberty, Seti has taken steps to ensure that his heir will have a large household as is traditional for a polygamous king in, in all these ancient Near Eastern societies, whether you're talking about the Hittites, uh, Assyria, Babylonia, uh, and Egypt, and this is well established for all these civilizations. Uh, and of course, we also see this uh, in, in the Bible with ancient Israel, and probably even a lot of these minor kingdoms like the Canaanites, kings were polygamous. They had multiple wives. And so, even before he becomes king himself, uh, Ramses as crown prince is being established with a large household with multiple wives. And especially since at this point, the future of the dynasty is, as I like to say, is hanging by a genetic thread. It's very important to make sure that the crown prince, you know, hits the ground running in terms of making sure that he produces heirs. So said he isn't going to take the chance of waiting uh, for uh, Ramses to begin producing heirs only after Seti himself has died. He wants to make sure that they're heirs and spares even before Ramses himself takes the throne. And I suspect uh, that there was something of a baby race that then goes on because uh, there are multiple women that are um, are chosen. Now, who these women are, even who what most of their names are, are completely unknown to us. I suspect that most of these, if not all of these women, are members of the elite circles of Egyptian society, most likely women that were uh, uh, members of the court elite. Some of them may have been members of the elite in local places across Egypt. So many of them may have been elite at the, at the royal a court like in Memphis or other you know places like Thebes, but there may have been local elites that you know rarely traveled to the capital, but were in in various towns across uh, the Nile. But whether there were any sort of lucky peasant girls who were ex exceptionally beautiful that were plucked from obscurity, you know that kind of thing sort of probably happens in fairy tales, but probably is unlikely. And in that sense, I think that these marriages, in many words, were kind of like diplomatic marriages, just as we know the pharaohs and Ramses himself 
married the daughters of foreign kings to mm -hmm. cement diplomatic relations with foreign kingdoms. That what uh, what Ramses and Seti are doing is is having diplomatic marriages with the power elite of Egypt itself to ensure that the new royal dynasty and the eventual new king would have good relations with the courtiers and the power structure of Egypt over whom he would soon uh, rule, and also to ensure that the new dynasty would have the loyalty with uh, the power structure who would be asked to accept the fact that this new dynasty of upstarts would not be questioned as the legitimate rulers of Egypt when people could remember that only a few years earlier that these people were not kings and were now expected to be accepted as kings. And so I think that's going on. Now, the, one, the, the, the person who uh, won the baby race, as it were, was a woman named Nefertari. She presented Ramses with the, his firstborn son. Uh, the woman who gave him the second-born son was a woman named Iset Nofred. And these were the, the first two little boys. And it may have been that they weren't not necessarily the first boys who were conceived or even uh, that were given uh, birth. There may have been other women that uh, became pregnant before them but suffered miscarriages, or even women that delivered uh, sons that were either stillborn or that died in infancy. The uh, infant and child mortality within the first uh, five years was probably about 50%. Rates of miscarriages of, of children that died within the first hours or days after being born were horrific. And even of the death of the mother or of stillbirth, all these things were just horrible. And so in many ways, uh, Nefertari's uh, eldest son, a boy named Amenhir Kopeshev, was the boy who lived. Uh, and Isit Nofret uh, was also ran. Her son was named Ramses after his father. And these two women then gained uh, notoriety as the, the ones that gave uh, birth to the first two viable male heirs. The other women, in fact, all the other women who produce Ramses, the vast majority of Ramses' children, we don't even know their names. They're completely anonymous. The only other wives of Ramses that we know, but that we can name, are the five wives that were actually his daughters who were all daughters of Isit Nofred or Nefertari. And uh, the first Hittite wife that he had, who was a foreign princess, other wives we can deduce, like the second Hittite wife that he married, and a Babylonian uh, princess that he married, and uh, a Syrian princess that he married. But we don't know what their names are. But all the other princes and princesses, we know the names of these uh, royal sons and daughters, but we don't know what their mother's names were. We have no idea. That's crazy. <laughs> so my, my question here is, Nefertari beca became the the main wife of Ramses, right? Yes. And it's primarily because she was the first one who gave birth to his son, right? Yes. Going back to Homhab, he also had multiple wives. So why didn't he assign great royal wife to someone who produced son for for or home hab the the woman who had died that we found, that they found in in his tomb at Saqqara was a woman named Mutnojmet and when he became pharaoh she was his great royal wife and she was the one that died so she she was the great royal wife now once she died it was theoretically possible i suppose that he could have taken a, another woman as a great royal wife and in fact it was possible for pharaohs to have multiple great royal wives. Why he didn't have other great royal wives or why he couldn't have had another woman serve in that capacity and, and have her produce a, a, a son is a, a reason we just simply don't know. I, I, I can't answer the question. I don't know why that was the case. But, you know, based on what happened, this that seems to have been what happened. Mm -hmm. So all we can say is, what happened, but we can't answer specifically why it happened that way. In the case of Ramsey, um, and th we see this also with the case of Amenhotep III or even Akhenaten, where we see cases where uh, kings have multiple great royal wives, and even sometimes uh, at the same time. So we have uh, Nefertari is Ramses II's great royal wife in the early part of his reign, after her death, um, we see uh, 
multiple great whale wives at the same time, where some of Ramsey's daughters become daughter wives. And they can have, there can be multiple great well wives where some of the daughters are great well wives at the same time. And then the Hittite princess, the first Hittite princess comes along and she is also great well wife at the same time as some of the daughter wives. We also see at the end of Amenhotep III's reign where Queen T, his principal great well wife since the beginning of his reign, holds that status. But then some of his daughters are also great well wives alongside their mother. So <laughs> it, it gets complicated. To be a yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> one thing I'm a little confused about, like obviously it was different time marrying your daughters was okay for pharaohs. I could kind of understand why the earlier pharaohs would do it. They probably thought they coming from gods and they were probably wanted to keep the pure, I don't know, divine blood and that's why they were marrying their daughters, which is as crazy as it sounds like maybe that was the explanation but ramses like what was his motivation i'm just curious just in general there's a, just especially with the 18th dynasty there's a couple of possible explanations one is that is divine precedent if you look at it and especially if you compare it to babylonian mythology in babylonian mythology we have this issue of the primordial gods where uh, I think it's Apsu and Tiamat, but the, there's there's a, a incestuous relationship between two of these early creator gods, uh, where they uh, you know have uh, this brother sister pairing of these uh, gods that have an incestuous relationship, and th- they almost have to because there's only two of them, and mm-hmm. if they're going to procreate and continue creation, this brother sister pair have to mate, and but then they're punished with it punished with it because it's impious. Uh, on the other hand, we also had brother-sister matches in Egyptian mythology. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, you know, uh, where Shu and Tefnut, these Egyptian uh, brother-sister gods, and then we have the four with Isis and Osiris, uh, brother-sister, and Seth and Nepsis, where there's their quadruplets, you know, of two brothers and two sisters, and they all pair off. But there's no no bad side to that in Egyptian mythology. So the gods set the precedent, and there's no negative fallout from that. Oh, the only bad thing happens is that Seth murders his brother, but that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the fact that they were all uh, incestuously related to each other. On the other hand, in the, in the 18th dynasty, the fact that there are these uh, brother-sister marriages between the kings of the 18th dynasty, who were also polygamous and marrying many wives and producing many children, one possible explanation for why they uh, had these brother-sister marriages is perhaps deliberately to reduce the pool of eligible children who might be considered for the succession. Because mm-hmm. if the king has dozens of wives and produce potentially even hundreds of children, and it, with Ramses, we know he had around 100 children, and this might have been actually just the minimum. <laughs> um, if you say the only children that are in the running are those children that are produced by the children he had with his sister, you shut off all these other children so they can't basically scheme and plot to try to overthrow the king. So mm-hmm. it's a safety valve to prevent you know, infighting or per- perhaps even revolution or plots against the pharaoh and his uh, favored heirs. It may have actually been a kind of protection uh, to prevent palace conspiracies. But of course, the genetic time bomb that it sets off ends up destroying the family through inbreeding. Yeah, and I believe you actually mentioned in the book that actually there is no clear evidence that Ramses had children with his daughter wives, right? So. Yeah. I'm only being agnostic. I'm not saying that he didn't or that he did. It's it, just yeah. I'm I'm saying that we don't know. Mm-hmm. On the okay. other hand, I think that a major part of it was was actually it was ceremonial. Uh, on the other hand, if we if we fast forward to the reign of of his successor, the Pharaoh Merneptah, who marries his older sister when they're both in their either their sixties or their seventies, I think at that point it's fairly safe to say that that it was not a sexual match. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, 
What was the first thing that he's done outside of kids as uh, Faro? Ramses? Yes, sorry. Well, he, he seems to have had a fairly busy uh, first year as, as, as king, although unlike his father, Seti, um, he doesn't launch an immediate uh, first campaign of victory, a sort of a military campaign. Of course, one of the first duties of the pharaoh is to conduct the burial rites of his predecessor. In fact, in Egyptian uh, culture, actually conducting the burial rites for your father was a, a kind of legitimating act that uh, ensured that you were his uh, legitimate heir, and all the more so for a pharaoh. So after the, the traditional 70-day period for uh, mummification, Ramses would have escorted uh, his father's uh, mummified remains, probably uh, said he would have died most likely in the north in his palace uh, near the city of Avaris in the northeastern delta after the mum or perhaps if he was in memphis and after the mummification process was finished and you know on the royal bards the the seti and seti's mummy and, and ramses and the royal court would have uh, traveled up river to the city of thebes the they would have had the funeral procession that would have uh, gone through the valley of the kings and uh, to deposit uh, Seti's remains and all his goods in the tomb, this would have been happening in uh, late summer in the, or in the early fall. It would have been still very hot. And then you would have actually celebrated one of the most important festivals in the annual religious calendar of ancient Thebes, uh, the festival of Opet. And in fact, this was a fortuitous event uh, for Ramses because this was... Uh, the most important festival that took place in ancient Thebes. And it was a festival of renewal for the fertility form of the god Amun-Re, but it also had a special connection for the king because it celebrated uh, a kind of mystical union between uh, this fertility form of the god Amun-Re and the king, where they had a kind of mystical union. And the way I like to put it is it, it kind of recharged their magical batteries. But through this uh, union of what are called their cause, uh, the Ka was a kind of uh, life force, every living thing, even the gods had this Ka. And the life force existed alongside the individual. Uh, they believed that when a person was created or conceived, their life force was also uh, conceived. When the king was conceived uh, by the gods, their life force was also conceived because the king was a divine or quasi-divine, his life force was divine. And there was a mythology uh, that's called the divine birth of the king, and it's believed in, in some sense that his ka, because it's divine, is what makes the king divine. Uh, it's one of these theories that's debated in, in Egyptology. And so by merging his ka with the ka of the god Amun, this recharges uh, both of their uh, their divine energies and their spirits. And so this was a very important uh, celebration that happened every year in Thebes. So the fact that this happened at the beginning of Ramses' reign, just after he had conducted uh, Seti's funeral and burial rites, was very fortuitous. Ramses then would have also overseen um, important building projects. And, and just uh, when Seti had died, uh, work had been going forward in some of his major building projects. Uh, they were trying to finish up work in the Great Hypostel Hall. They were working on Seti's uh, cultic temple, the so-called mortuary temple or royal cult temple at Gorna. And work had just begun on a major addition to the temple of Luxor, uh, south of Karnak. And in fact, this is the venue for the Opet festival. And Seti had envisioned a, a huge entry away with pylons, obelisks, and colossal statues for Luxor temple. But work had barely begun. And um, these giant statues and obelisks were one of the more remarkable kinds of monuments that the pharaohs built. And uh, just a couple of years before Seti's death, he had sent Ramses, well, the, both of them had gone to the site of Aswan in southern Egypt to the granite quarries because Seti wanted to commission multiple obelisks and colossal statues 
the obelisks were dedicated to the sun cult, uh, and the giant statues represented the divine form of the king. And um, Seti envisioned to decorate uh, temples at Heliopolis and uh, Thebes with perhaps dozens of these obelisks, as well as uh, giant statues that were meant to represent his divine form. Unfortunately for Seti, only a couple of these obelisks were completed before his death, and none of the colossal statues. And uh, two years later, Ramses inherited many of these monoliths incomplete. And so when you go to a Luxor temple today, you see these giant statues and one of these obelisks, and the other one is now in the Place de la Concorde in, in Paris, all inscribed with the names of Ramses. And these were the fruits of, of Seti's initial work and uh, Ramses uh, completing them. What do you think are the highlights of Ramses' reign? Well, one of the most pivotal events took place in his fifth regnal year, and this, of course, is the famous Battle of Kadesh. Uh, it was actually his second military campaign. There was a, a, a less well-known event that was probably sort of a military tour, uh, you know, what I like to call chariot diplomacy the year before. But he led his armies uh, in the fifth year of his reign to assault the, the city of Kadesh in the southern part of Syria in the region of modern homes. This had formerly belonged to Egypt, and uh, the Egyptians had been desperately trying to recover it because the, the Hittite Empire had taken control of it. Uh, it's one of the more infamous uh episodes in the reign. Uh, there were a number of other military campaigns thereafter. This was the end of a long grudge match, a, a war that that went on between Egypt and the Hittite Empire for the better part of 60 years. Uh, fast forward to the 21st year of Ramses II's reign, and uh, finally, after again six decades, the Egyptians and the Hittites finally come to peace, and Ramses concludes a peace treaty, one of the uh, earliest peace treaties between two great uh, independent nations, uh, and the earliest perfectly preserved peace treaty that we have between two great kingdoms. And then uh, about a dozen years later, uh, as Ramses is celebrating um, one of the earliest uh, great jubilee festivals of his reign, he marries a, a Hittite princess, the first of two Hittite princesses that he marries during his second jubilee in year 34. And this marks a high point of his reign. It's literally uh, halfway uh, through his long reign of almost 67 years. And at this point, we also see a transition from the period that he's a great warrior king to a, a period when he essentially becomes uh, almost a, a living god on earth. It's also when we see his building program, if anything, uh, continue to ramp up. He's built many monuments in the first half of his reign, but he, he continues to build uh, temples, especially in Nubia. And increasingly, uh, his uh, promotion of his divine kingship continues unabated throughout the reign uh, in his later years. I would say those are the, the the high points of his reign. As he continues to reign then for the second half of his reign, time almost seems to stand still. Mm -hmm. uh, we have fewer and fewer dated inscriptions, and yet every three years he celebrates these jubilee festivals. And as time goes on, the king becomes older and older. He becomes more frail. He must have become a much more distant figure for his subjects. His crown princes, especially the last two crown princes, Prince Kamwasa and the final crown prince who succeeds him eventually, uh, Merneptah, uh, sort of rule the kingdom in his name. Uh, he becomes exceedingly frail. Um, he uh, becomes bent over with age. Uh, he even mimics the sun god, who in mythology was said to become a an old man bent over with age and drooling on the ground, so that even in his dotage, Ramses mimics the sun god. And we know from his mummy that he suffered any number of afflictions. And in fact, when we look at his mummy, this image of the of this grandiose figure and this uh, god king, it's for the, we we suddenly see the real truly human Ramses II. 
in his twilight. He just fades away, I suppose. But then when he finally dies, it must have been a cataclysmic experience for uh, all uh, Egyptians. At the point that he dies, his people could not remember any other king. Even halfway through his reign, there would have been relatively few people when he celebrates his that second jubilee when he marries the Hittite princess, f- relatively few people would have remembered uh, the days of his father, Seti I. You think about in 2011 when Hosni Mubarak was overthrown uh, during the Egyptian revolution, how few Egyptians even today would still remember the days of Anwar Sadat. So think about what it must have been like in ancient Egypt when the annual average life expectancy was 35. And then you think about when Ramses dies uh, after 66 and a half years, and he himself is in his early 90s or late 80s. They truly believe that he's a god, right? Well, essentially, yeah. I mean, he was referred to, we call him Ramses the Great, the only pharaoh that has actually given that title, but they called him Ramses the Great God. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk about a bottle of Kadesh, because that seems to be like an interesting subject where my understanding is he a little bit exaggerated what really happened on, on the battlefield, right? Oh, it wasn't a little bit that he exaggerated. He exaggerated <laughs> a lot. Let's like talk really about a lot. <laughs> in, in many ways, it's the hype about the Battle of Kadesh that's the real story. And of course, one of the things is um, many people would argue that it's an example of almost like the big lie. Or it's, it's the world's biggest fish story and that Ramses is desperately trying to uh, deceive us. And, and even to the point where I think people can exaggerate the significance of the event, saying it was really worse for Ramses than it really was. Uh, but this was n- no doubt a watershed in the king's reign and something that he m- made a big deal of. He leads his armies uh, to assault this town, which had fallen to the Hittite Empire sometime during the reign of the pharaoh Akhenaten. And this battle of Kadesh was really only one of a series of battles of Kadesh. Uh, The city had been, uh, if you will, a kind of bee in the bonnet of the Egyptians ever since the time of of Tutmosis III in the earlier 18th dynasty. The Egyptians seemed to have conquered it back in the days of uh, Tutmosis III. It had fallen to the Hittites in the reign of Akhenaten, and a number of pharaohs from Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, probably Horemheb, and then successfully under Seti, had attempted to recapture it from the Hittites. And only Seti had temporarily, possibly Horemheb temporarily, had managed to recover it. But even when they had success, the Hittites had quickly recovered it. And uh, it was just rather difficult because it was much closer to the Hittites than it was to the Egyptian. But uh, the Egyptians just couldn't let go, quite literally, of Kadesh. And they seem to have been fixated on recovering this for the Egyptian empire. And so once again, like Moth to the Flame, uh, Ramses was determined to recapture the city. Uh, and so he marched his armies uh, in the fifth year of his reign to lay siege to the place. Uh, and he has this very detailed narrative. We have a rather simple and brief image uh, on the walls of Karnak Temple that shows Seti successfully capturing the, uh, the the citadel, a very brief rhetorical inscription and a beautiful scene that shows that Seti captured the place. There's no great detail of his uh, representation. But Ramses has a very elaborate series of poetic and rhetorical uh, text in with much detail and these complex a series of pictorial scenes that in great detail describe how the king uh, attempted to capture the the town, you know, with a lot of detail to tell us exactly what happened on the day that he uh, assaulted the town. And of course, how it didn't exactly go to plan. And we have to remember, however, that all the de- all the information that informs us about what went wrong is actually given to uh, to us by Ramses II. So if we want to call him a liar for for claiming that he had success, we have to remember that Ramses is giving us the information. He's washing his dirty laundry in in public. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you look at the record, nowhere does he actually claim 
that he captured the town. The claim that he makes that is perhaps unbelievable, well, it is unbelievable, is that he single-handedly defeated the Hittite ambush on his encampment and that he single-handedly repulsed the Hittite uh, advance. He nowhere claims that he captured the town. Hmm. Second of all, when we consider this uh, you know, unbelievable tale that he alone repulsed the Hittite attack, if we look at every other single Egyptian uh, battle narrative of every other Egyptian pharaoh from the New Kingdom, Thutmosis III, Seti I, Amenhotep II, any other battle narrative that talks about how an Egyptian pharaoh and his armies fought against uh, a foreign enemy, every single one of them claims that the pharaoh single-handedly defeated the enemy, and that if the army is mentioned at all, the army screws up or gets in the way, and the pharaoh is the one that actually achieves victory. So when Ramsey says that he single-handedly defeated the enemy, he's just saying what every other pharaoh says. And as far as claiming that he won, that's normal. And as far as claiming that he captured Kadesh, he says no such thing. Well, I'll give so, him credit there. Good. Yeah. So <laughs> so if if you want to accuse Ramses for lying, well, he never says he captured Kadesh. And if he's lying, well, so is every other pharaoh. So, and I don't think we should think about it as he's lying or that the pharaohs are lying. This is about Egyptian royal ideology. And mm -hmm. in the Egyptian worldview, the pharaoh is a lone super warrior that is a divine being who single handedly defeats his enemies on the battlefield. And in fact, if we also look at the battle accounts of other ancient kings, the Babylonian kings, the Hittite kings, the Assyrian kings, the kings of Mitanni, we actually find the same thing. The king is a lone warrior who single-handedly defeats his enemies. And so this, again, is the, the common culture of the ancient world. In front of me, I have this hieroglyphic writing that I think it's from Bulletin that you also yes. have it in your book. Um, I'm wondering if you could interpret these hier hieroglyphs. I'm curious how you read it, because it's, it's interesting to me. It's almost like emojis, you know, in the modern world. Basically, what you have is, is a section from the bulletin. And uh, just to describe it, really, uh, you know, you have the date line, and then it describes how the king was in Syria during his second campaign of victory, and that he had reached the area just to the south of Kadesh, and uh, and you know he was waking up in his encampment, and then how they marched the last day of March and arrived at the site of Kadesh, and as they were marching towards Kadesh, they intercepted these two Bedouin uh, from you know this this Bedouin tribe called the Shasu. They intercepted these two Bedouin tribesmen and uh, who reported that they had left in you know, the following of the king of uh, of Hatti uh, the Hittites and claimed that their brethren wanted to, essentially to defect from the Hittites and to join the service of the pharaoh and uh, the pharaoh uh, wanted to know what was going on with the king of the Hittites and the Hittite forces and these guys basically said well the Hittite king is at the city of Aleppo which was like 10 days march it's like you know more than 100 miles north of kadesh and they claimed that the hittite king was too afraid of ramses to come south and of course this pleased the pharaoh but of course as the narrator of the text tells us that, that these guys were lying and in fact that the uh, hittites were lying in ambush on the other side of kadesh just waiting for ramses to approach and uh, the Egyptian army was strung out uh, because you had these four divisions, and Ramses was leading the the first of these divisions, the division of Amun. And you get this case where Ramses and his lead division, uh, uh, you know, march forward, and they arrive on the west side of Kadesh and pitch their camp. And in fact, it, it describes the pharaoh taking the lead. And uh, very often people sort of chastise the pharaoh as sort of this foolish young hothead who flies ahead even of his lead division and exposes himself to danger. 
uh, and and is gullible for believing the lies and disinformation that these two uh, Bedouin spies have fed him. So he is at one point reckless uh, and at the same time somehow naive, you know, for buying this fish story that they've told him and that he's deliberately exposing himself to danger, et cetera, et cetera. But, I mean, the whole story is a bit of an exaggeration. And second of all, in terms of uh, what's going on here, he's he's got this huge army that just has to be uh, strung out. You couldn't march four large divisions in one big blob through a rather narrow series of mountain passes. So when he received this information, uh, his own uh, military intelligence had been telling him for days that uh, the Hittites were much further north, uh, marching well to the north of Kadesh at the city of Aleppo. And so the information he had just received from these uh, these Bedouin uh, matched the reports that he had been getting for days. So the idea that he would just continue with the, the standard plan that had been developed and finish out the day's march seems much more like a, a rational uh, decision rather than sort of a, a reckless gamble. Because again, the new information matched everything he had been getting so far. Now, when he did get to uh, Kadesh and did set up his, um, his uh, camp, his scouts picked up a couple of Hittite scouts and they brought them in and interrogated them. First, they gave them a good beating. Then they interrogated them and they dragged them before the king and the king questioned them. And uh, this time, the Hittite scouts told them that, in fact, the Hittite army was on the other side of Kadesh waiting in ambush. And at this point, the king was just furious. And I think that picture you have in the scene actually shows the Hittite scouts getting the the, uh, the hell beat out of them. Uh, what they, they told the king, of course, was that the, 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 ar- the ambush was about to take place. And in fact, it did. And uh, the, the the pharaoh was just completely enraged. And he brought all his uh, advisors before him and told them, gave them a good tongue lashing and told them, you know, you've been telling me for days. All my advisors and all uh, the officers had been telling me for days that, they, that, you know, the Hittites were, you know, 10 days march away in the city of Aleppo. But I've just heard from these spies that they're, in fact, waiting to ambush me on the other side of Kadesh. So everything so, you just said is is uh, over here on this page or? Yeah, so the, all the, the text. So the text is, <laughs> yeah, so the, it's it's interesting because the, the text and the images go together. Interesting. Uh, it, they blend the, the narrative description of the events in the text with the the scenes that are shown. So um what and that's just part of it. It it continues in a long pair of, of scenes. I can see if I can show it to you because I've got the pictures on my wall. Can you see the the picture that I've got there? That's another version of it. Yes. Except yep. this one the colors are not uh the hieroglyphs are not in color. And you see the second picture, the king is sitting on his throne. Yep, I see that two people. Yeah, and so in. yeah, and then uh, the the guys are being beaten. The the guys are, there's the king's chariot horse waiting, some soldiers, and then the guards uh, that are guarding the king below, and the king's sitting on his throne. So that's what's going on, <laughs> and uh, the king is interviewing his officials, and uh, and basically finding out that everything's going wrong. <laughs> what's the deal with uh, interchangeably calling them pharaohs and kings? Well, there are a number of different uh, names and titles that Egyptian kings had. One of the particularly unique ones that has come down, of course, in our culture is pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Um, originally, the word pharaoh applied uh, to the to the royal palace or the royal household. It comes from the, the Egyptian term para which means the great house. The pharaoh, him, the king himself, the, the closest term we have for for king is w- with the Egyptians, uh, the word Nesu. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there were a number of other names and titles that referred to the king. Originally, per a'a, or pharaoh, referred to the um, the royal house or the, the palace. But by the new king, 
by the New Kingdom, and especially by the Ramazide period, increasingly it could refer to the king as an individual. Imagine if the term palace, or in the case of the U.S. president, the term White House. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, when we we used to say, you know, if you say the White House announced today, yeah, or the White House policy on this. Now, today, when we say the White House said, we know we're talking about the the administration. You say the Biden administration or the president presidential administration. We know we're not talking about the president as an, an individual person. We know we're talking about the presidential administration. Mm-hmm. Imagine if eventually when we said the White House, but we know we're talking about the president himself and not his administration. So, you know, the White House gave a speech today, but mm-hmm. we're talking about the president himself. That's what's happened by this time period. And of course, one of the reasons I suspect that we we use it so much, and it's not just because by Ramsey's time, the pharaoh is used so often to refer to the king himself, but also because it becomes the preferred term to refer to the Egyptian king in the Bible. Because when in the Bible, when they talk about the king of Egypt, they call him Pharaoh. They never call him by other terms that were common in Egypt to refer to the king of Egypt. And in fact, in the Bible, we rarely find the names of individual kings. One of the only ones that I know of is Shishak, who is this king from uh, one of the later dynasties that is mentioned by name. Otherwise, when they refer to the king of Egypt, he's just Pharaoh, such as the king in the Exodus account, to the point where it doesn't matter who the king of Egypt is. He's just Pharaoh. That's all that matters. So in Ramses' time, although they referred to him as Ramses II, very often he can just be called Pharaoh uh, when you're just referring to the the king. What was the ultimate reason for decline and almost disappearance of the ancient Egypt? Not disappearance, but decline, I'd say. It depends, you know, what you mean by decline. I'm a bit skeptical of a lot of these traditional kind of decline narratives, especially when you're talking about like, you know, Gibbon's idea of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about the, the the sort of imperial decline, I mean, if you're talking about Egypt being an empire, and certainly out in the later Ramazide period, as it lost control of you know, its empire in the Levant or, you know, in, in Nubia, you do see the l- decline of traditional imperial control. There are all kinds of changes that happen that lead to the end of the late Bronze Age. And a lot of these great empires, the Hittite Empire completely disappears, the fall of a lot of the uh, Canaanite kingdoms across the Levant, the Babylonian Empire at the time goes into decline. And of course, there's the rise of new uh, powers, you know, the Philistines that come in, the uh, Iron Age Israel, you have uh, the Neo-Assyrian Empire that that comes, uh, that arises. And Egypt within its own borders changes dramatically. It, it loses its empire in the Levant and of course in Nubia. The, the kingdom of Kush becomes powerful, and eventually it expands into Egypt. Egypt also, during the first millennium uh, BC, becomes subject to other empires, you know, uh, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, etc. And from that perspective, you can talk about Egyptian decline. But in terms of Egyptian culture, it it thrives. It's just different. But there's no real decadence. The Egyptian culture is very resilient. So I wouldn't call, in that sense, a, a decline of Egyptian culture or a decline of Egyptian civilization. In fact, it, it proved to be very re- resilient and adaptive, even in the face of the fact that very often Egyptians were no longer their own masters and that they were able to assimilate and, and adjust and adapt to the fact that that often foreigners were ruling them and adapted even when these foreign rulers were trying to impose their own cultures on Egypt. And you could see that, uh, for instance, when uh, Egypt comes under the rule of the Hellenistic Greek dynasty, the Ptolemaic dynasty, and then also under the rule of the Roman Empire. And it really isn't until essentially the rise of Christianity, which of course is a monotheistic religion in which polytheism is anathema. 
it's only then really that um, the culture of pharaonic times, you know, becomes uh, extinguished because it's completely incompatible with uh, Christianity. So the hieroglyphs, the polytheistic gods, all that kind of thing, you know, have to go. But even then, of course, the language of the Coptic Church is the last uh, phase of the spoken language of the pharaohs. And even a few of the signs a few of the letters in the Coptic script, which basically is an adapted form of the Greek alphabet. There are a few uh, signs in the Coptic alphabet which are missing from the Greek alphabet that are adapted from the Demotic script. Demotic is the successor of Hieratic. So even then, uh, there's a little bit of the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph Hieratic script that makes it into this last phase of otherwise sort of adapted from Greek, the, the Coptic script. And of course, then that finally goes by the wayside with the Arab conquest and the, the, the coming of, of the Arabic language and of Islam to Egypt. To me, the, it's not so much about the decline of pharaonic culture, but just about the uh, the durability of it. Really. I didn't realize all that. Yeah, that, that's true. And it's fascinating. It's probably the subject for another discussion how e Egyptian culture survived, it, how it was so durable. That's very interesting. Well, Professor Brandt, thank you very much for for your time. It was a great discussion. And I really recommend the books that you've written.